on the screen, you can start the session, Mr. Kaushik. All right, good luck, everyone. Morning, Gossip. Good morning, Shumuliani. How are you? How are you? Hi, Dani. Hi, Bumari. Hi, Bani. Yeah. All right. Good morning to you, Shumuliani. So I'm very unfortunate not to welcome you in person. Are we starting now? No. <laughs> I think we can start. Yeah. We can, yeah. Okay. Should we start? Yeah, I think we, we need, we should start. Okay. Go ahead, Okay, okay. Welcome everybody. Uh, you've just heard the opening addresses, but this is the opening panel. We are going to get now into something more substantial to related to topics. Uh, this is, as you know, on Asian and global policy issues. Let me just say a few words before we start off that IEA plays a very, very special role and really stands out as an organization that straddles the world of ideas and science and the world of policymaking. And it also plays a very special role as an economics organization that we try to bring in countries from around the world, from small nations, poor nations, we bring people in. This time, of course, we are doing it all virtually given the very difficult situation where we are, but that is the spirit in which we are approaching today's meeting. This is also a very, very special moment for Asia. Uh, the pandemic, as you know, it is one wave after another is coming. All the countries are reeling. At the same time, this is being viewed by many as a time of hope, time when you can turn policies around and look towards the future. It is in that spirit that we are today bringing together in front of you some of the best minds from the world of research and from the world of policy. We really wanted to bring people who straddle both these. There are three speakers. Uh, we will first have Her Excellency, Sri Muliani Indravati, uh, Professor Danny Roderick, Dr. Mari Paniestu. I'm going to introduce each of these speakers in that order separately as we bring them in. So let me plunge right in. I, a couple of uh, rules uh, of how we will do this. We are running a bit behind time. Initially, the speakers were given 15 minutes. If you can squeeze it in a little bit, 12 minutes or so, that will still leave us a little bit of time for people in the audience who may want to ask questions. We do want to do that. But if you are running short of time, we will have to do without that. So let me introduce the first speaker today. That is the Minister of Finance of Indonesia, uh, Sri Mulyani Indravati. As she just said in the opening address, uh, I worked with her very closely when we were both in the World Bank. She was managing director of the World Bank. And before that, again, she was for a period Minister of Finance of Indonesia. What Sri Mulyani may not remember is the first time I met her was before all that, it was a think tank meeting in Delhi, much before all that. Very high powered meeting with Joe Stiglitz, Nemat Shafiq, the philosopher Rob Riemann, where Shrimuliani had come. I had met her for the first time. It really gives me great pleasure 
to have her as the first speaker, Indonesia is standing at a crossroad where people are beginning to bet on the Indonesian economy despite the difficult times. It is one of the brighter sparks that is managing the very difficult management of the pandemic and also the economy. Given that there is talk of Indonesia as a possible economy that will come out strong, and she as a, as a finance minister has played an important role, it's my pleasure to give her the floor to open today's panel discussion, Srimulyani. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kavik, for a very generous introduction. Uh, it's uh, really good to see you, although I regret it that you cannot see in person. Let me share you uh, how we respond to this very challenging time, and especially also providing a perspective uh, where we want to go as a country, as uh, uh, COVID mentioned, uh, mentioned that this is going to be a very challenging time. First, when we see this uh, COVID uh, hit uh, the economy, of course, the whole economy suffered from the contraction because the COVID-19 preventing people to do the activity and that stability have a strong correlation with the economic activity. So the contraction of the economy is unavoidable. So for us then, uh, the question is how we are going to respond with this very extraordinary situation. Not only that the economy under threat, but also the safety uh, of the people also under threat. So the response is how uh, the instrument like fiscal policy should be designed in a much more flexible way. For Indonesia, we then enacted an emergency law, which is then become a law in which Indonesia, which traditionally have a very disciplined below 3% deficit fiscal, uh, fiscal deficit and not to allow 60% of debt GDP ratio, relaxing those cap of 3% uh, deficit because we suffer from the contraction on the revenue, uh, almost 20%, 19.7%. And uh, at the same time, the spending is definitely increased because of the health reason, social safety net, support for uh, the business, especially small and medium enterprises, but also for the corporation. So with that kind of uh, a priority, we then decided to allow the deficit to increase from 1.76% of GDP originally for 2020, widened into 6.1%. We were very flexible and responsive to the need that when the economic activity halted or stopped, that means people cannot earn income. And in Indonesia, like many emerging or developing countries, we have many segments of the people activity at the informal sector. So the most important is how you are going to reach to these people. Maybe not uh, completely, uh, in this case, uh, 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 targeted because the data as well as the system not always put in place, but we uh, are enacted what we call it increasing social safety net up to even 50% of our population. With that, we were able to at least uh, uh, creating a momentum of recovery starting on the second half of the year uh, beginning last year. And we see also a very rapid recovery on the second half, uh, on the uh, second quarter of this year. But we are not complacent, because as you all know, uh, dealing with this COVID is like you always deal with uh, like how to accelerate and how to break when the situation is becoming unmanageable. As I mentioned in opening at this very moment, the Indonesian government have to enact the break on the acceleration of the economic activity because of the escalation of the cases. So these are all a situation which is, I don't think that any textbook in the economics provide us with any uh, way of lesson how to deal with this very dynamic uncertainty. But despite that, Indonesia, as I mentioned in, in the opening, we will accelerate the vaccination and we will continue to even use this crisis to deeper our reform. This is one of the most important lesson causes because if you see that, use the crisis as an opportunity to reform. Although we are very overwhelmed with COVID, of course, but uh, we also continue to discuss with the parliament how to address the issue on the investment climate and trade to be more efficient. 
So we have one in the lifetime of Indonesia, Omnibus Law, 72 law has been a man into one law to address the issue of many hurdles, obstacles, or uh, in this case, cost of doing business with this high. That is very historical for Indonesia. With that, we do hope that Indonesia will come up stronger. Now, I'm also launching the tax reform. This is also, despite that we are still uh, struggle with the COVID, we are not, in this case, put our attention, uh, shifting our attention that the country need a stronger and a bolder foundation for Indonesia to continue grow in a more sustainable, equitable, uh, and inclusive way. These are all that we are now doing. At the same time, knowing that the human capital is very critical, we also put in place uh, two ministers, that is education and health, to reform these two very critical sectors. So with that COVID, I would uh, just want uh, to share with all the audience here that uh, when you are dealing with a crisis, uh, and that means this is a very important opportunity to even continue and putting a place a very ambitious reform so that the country will not waste this crisis. The country will be able to even come up and building a stronger foundation. With that, the recovery as well as the reform, uh, currently we are continue doing a very uh, a balancing act how we are going to continue supporting the recovery. But at the same time, as a finance minister, I have to consolidate our fiscal, which is being used or being, uh, in this case, in the position to take out all this COVID uh, situation uh, quite uh, strongly. So the deficit last year, 6.1%. This year is going to be a little bit lower at 57 And we will continue in stages uh, and measure the fiscal consolidation next year that we are currently now uh, in discussion with the parliament. With that, we do hope that we are going to find the right balance between supporting the recovery of the economy and maintaining a sustainability and health of our fiscal tool in the medium and long term. What does it mean? It does mean that we have to continue improve our revenue. And that means tax reform is very, very important. How we are going to address in a more equitable the revenue across sectoral, because in Indonesia, in this case, although we are an open economy, but not a sector is actually exposed to this globalization and becoming more productive. Some of them is still very much under protection. And that's why we are going to make sure that the productivity is going to be shared. Uh, we are also lowering many of the tariffs, but at the same time, we are going to have a non-tax revenue, which is uh, aiming for how we are going to generate revenue in a more sustainable way, especially for the natural resources, uh, uh, considering the sustainability as well as uh, public services. On the spending side, we really need to improve our spending. And that means whether this is related to the uh, central government spending or local government spending. And that's why currently we're also reforming central local government uh, fiscal transfer. This is very critical for Indonesia in which we are a big country, 34 provincial area, and more than, uh, more than 540 uh, district area in Indonesia. So local government fiscal transfer is almost one third of our spending. And that's why improving and creating a better coordination with the central government spending is very critical. Then we have to deal with the increasing debt. Although Indonesia at the very before COVID uh, is still uh, at the 38% of GDP, debt to GDP, but now because of this COVID, it will increase to around 44 to 45%. This also requires a good uh, as well as prudent management. Considering the global environment, as I mentioned in the opening, that uh, the mon uh, monetary policy as well as inflation in the United States definitely will have a spillover for many emerging countries. So with that, we try to make sure that Indonesia is going to use this opportunity to reform and also improving the quality of spending, especially because now we are using many of the digital technology 
to conduct many of uh, our business or our uh, work. And that's definitely need to be captured uh, in the way we are going to design our spending policy. So Kosi, I would like to just close by saying that uh, this is a very important time. It's challenging, extraordinary, but we should not uh, shifting our focus uh, into what is really matter for the people, especially when we are uh, trying and striving to create prosperity for all in a more inclusive way. So in this very particular moment, I think a very important principle of economics, good techno technocratic policy is even more needed. But we also know that we work uh, in a non-vacuum political environment, whether we are talking at the global level as well as the national level. At the national level, I'm fortunate to have a good political environment in which the parliament and the government working together to define what is really needed and to push the reward even, even further. At the global level, I think geopolitical is gonna be more complicated. And these are the areas that I would like to hear more from the IEA in terms of what is going to be the globalization, as you mentioned on the opening, where the direction that we can address what is lacking before, especially in the element of equality and inclusiveness. How the global system, the trade system can be actually combined with the ability to create an affirmative policy that is going to be making sure that this policy will be equitable and enjoyed by a majority of the people, whether this is within country as well as globally. I think uh, that's what I'm, I would like to share with you all. Just one last sentence in this case, that at the G20, because Indonesia is going to become a president of G20, we also push this uh, uh, reform as well as uh, the policy issue that can create more equitable uh, prosperity, prosperity for all. That's including global taxation and digital taxation, because these are all the area which is going to be continue important, but at the same time, many countries still struggle and grapple with how you are going to establish a just uh, and fair taxation across country. So with that, I would like to again uh, close uh, by saying that uh, a challenging task, challenging time, but I'm very optimistic, especially with all good minds and thinking that is going to contribute during this uh, meeting and Congress will also help many policymakers to come continue improving and shaping their policy. Thank you, Kossi. Thank you very much, uh, Shimuliani. Uh, in fact, these are some of the issues, the global part of it, which is very close to IEA's uh, concerns. And we hope that the World Congress will actually be a basis of future engagement of IEA with uh, Indonesia in many different ways. Your talk, um, uh, we have got lots of listeners and clearly you have provoked because there are questions beginning to come in. We won't take the questions right now. We'll go through with all the three speakers. And at the end, depending on the time, we will take in some of them. So let us move right away to the incoming president of IA, Danny Roderick. Danny is a Ford Foundation Professor of International Political Economy at Harvard. Uh, before that, um, he was at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And he's one of the most prominent economists and one of the most progressive voices in the world. He did his PhD from Princeton University. He has numerous books. I'll recommend two to you because time is short. The Globalization Paradox, that's one. Straight Talk on Trade, Ideas for a Sane World Economy. But let me not take any more time on introduction. Danny, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kaushik. It's, it's a great pleasure and honor uh, for me to be a part of this panel. Uh, let me begin by um, thanking first uh, our uh, virtual host and, and co-sponsor, uh, the Indonesian government and um, uh, uh, the Minister of Finance, uh, Sri Mulyani. Um, thank you very much for, for making this, uh, this, this possible. Um, and um, uh, time is short, so I think I will just uh, say a few words uh, about um, the, the global context um, as, as I see it um, and, and where we might be headed. 
Um, I think uh, the most important and interesting thing that I see is, is a kind of um, a, a transition um, for which the um, pandemic uh, 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 seems to be a turning point, although the transition itself is not because of the pandemic, but the pandemic makes the transition, I think, much more obvious and transparent uh, and easier to see. But the transition that I see is uh, from um, roughly a quarter century of um, convergence uh, in the world uh, in terms of uh, economic performance uh, with developing countries uh, for the most part actually uh, doing extremely well. Um, of course, uh, East and Southeast Asia has been doing well for quite some time, but that this, this became a much more broadly shared uh, a feature of, of Asia, including South Asia, um, and spread to sub, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America as well, which have had um, prior to the pandemic for a decade or two, we're really having uh, some of the best periods of economic growth uh, in, in, in quite a long time, so that we were really having a convergence in economic uh, uh, um, performance. And there was a certain amount of convergence in, in uh, thinking about economic policy and uh, sort of what good uh, technocratic economic policy might be, if I can use the, the term technocracy, so technocratic economic policy that, that I heard uh, Sri Mulyani uh, refer to. Um, now, I think this period of, of uh, convergence, as I see it, the one that we might be going into, looks to me like it's going to be much more um, uh, a period of divergence. And I think there are certain risks as well as some opportunities there. I think the, the, um, the, the divergence um, is on the one hand coming from um, uh, the, the very uh, delayed effects relative to the advanced countries of the pandemic in the developing world. Um, uh, and what I'm referring to there is the fact that if you looked at the the adverse uh, impacts on mortality and health of COVID, uh, it, it hit the, the advanced countries much more and much more quickly uh, than it hit the developing world. And I think that it looks like the advanced economies are going to be recovering rather quickly uh, with um, a rapid rebound, uh, but that the recovery is going to be much slower and much more uneven. Uh, in the developing world. And in fact, uh, because of lack of access to vaccine and the weakness of public health systems, uh, that the effects of the pandemic, even in the best scenario, are going to be much more drawn out, drawn out over time uh, in the developing world uh, than in the advanced world. So uh, the critical implication of this is that, that this progress in terms of economic convergence and the poorer countries catching up in terms of income levels with the uh, rich countries, uh, at least initially in the next few years, may very well be reversed uh, with many developing countries, uh, perhaps not uh, Indonesia, many countries in East and Southeast Asia, which are still relatively well positioned, but certainly in the low income countries in particular, uh, that those many of those gains in terms of poverty reduction uh, and increases in income uh, um, may well be reversed and, and, and lost. Um, so that's the one dimension of, of uh, divergence that we might be getting into this period of divergence in terms of economic uh, performance. But there's an, a, a, a more uh, a deeper and perhaps more long lasting uh, uh, phenomenon of, of divergence or decoupling, if you will, uh, in terms of the intellectual uh, thinking about economic policy. And I think this is very important. And I think here, uh, in many ways, the United States and the Biden administration is leading the way, but the overall transformation about the narratives about what good economic policy consists of that we've been seeing um, in the United States are really quite dramatic. Now, it's not quite uh, clear what the actual policy on the ground implications of this is going to be. In other words, if the Republicans are going to let uh, Biden get away with the things that he wants to do. Uh, but nonetheless, I think the central narrative arc of economic policy is undergoing significant change in the advanced countries, particularly in the United States. 
And I'm not sure that the same is also happening in the developing world. Um, and um, in terms of where we see uh, these uh, significant transformations in economic policy, we see it all over the world. I mean, all over the uh, different policy domains from macro to micro. In monetary policy, we have central banks, the Fed, and even to some extent, the European Central Bank are talking a very different talk in terms of their approach to fiscal policy in the United States, actually encouraging expansionist fiscal policy, um, you know, tut tutting inflation hawks and saying that, oh, the rise in prices are only temporary. This is Fed speaking. Um, and the European Central Bank now actually talking now actively about the need to cooperate uh, with fiscal authorities. Um, uh, um, in fiscal policy, we're seeing a clear shift uh, in preference uh, um, towards um, overheating. If there is going to be a risk, it's in the direction of moving in the direction of overheating the economy to generate um, um, increased employment and demand, um, rather than sort of you know sort of conservatism on the debt front and inability conservatism. So the, the entire line of thinking on fiscal policy, particularly in the United States, has shifted dramatically. In corporate taxation, of course, we see how we've moved from uh, taking the sort of race to the bottom as a given phenomenon that nobody could do anything about to the uh, agreement that was signed um, yesterday, or I guess in Indonesia today, you know, today in the United States, in yesterday from Indonesia's perspective, uh, with 130 countries on to this new international tax agreement that sets a global minimum and some rules on apportioning taxes. Industrial policy is back in terms of actual uh, uh, formal acceptance. Of course, it never went away. Countries always were you know, doing industrial policy, but now you have a Biden administration that is actually saying we are going to be doing industrial policy and this is how. So owning up to it and taking pride in it. Labor markets, a significant change uh, from deregulation, deinstitutionalization uh, to an explicit focus on empowering uh, labor, empowering labor unions. Uh, in, with respect to big tech and, and platforms, uh, a significant shift in attitudes uh, from looking at big tech and platforms as a source of innovation and consumer benefits uh, to uh, essentially as monopolies that need to be uh, either, you know, broken up or treated harshly. Um, and of course, in trade policy and globalization, um, a shift from a focus on efficiency to a focus on, on resilience, um, uh, which implies a very different approach. So in all of these domains, there is a significant transformation uh, in the intellectual framework for policy that is taking place in the United States, uh, and to a lesser extent, but still visibly in, in Europe as well. Um, now, I don't see the counterparts of this so much uh, um, in the developing world as much, um, but I don't think that's because the developing world doesn't need new thinking either. So I think there are a number of changes going on, the implications of technological change, developments in labor markets, a somewhat very different picture for the future of globalization, um, conflict with China and uh, the geopolitical implications of that, all are um, present a kind of a different context, which I, th I think will also require changes in the way that developing countries have thought of what in terms of what good economic policy consists of. So, um, uh, so I see us moving into a world where there's going to be uh, increased decoupling between uh, developing and developed world, both in terms of performance, as well as I think more deeply and fundamentally in terms of thinking about economic policy. Now that, could, that does not necessarily need to be a bad thing, um, certainly the differences in economic views and it might lead to greater discord, but it might also be uh, an occasion for a fruitful uh, intellectual ferment and the generation of new ideas. We, of course, at, at the IEA hope that it's going to be the latter and that we hope to be um, uh, leading uh, in, in that effort 
um, and uh, and working with um, with policymakers in the developing world. So um, let me just uh, stop here um, and and uh, and pass the baton back to Kashi. Danny, um, uh, thank you very much. Um, again, these are very, very deep challenges. It's a very worrying moment for the world. You, you uh, draw our attention to it. And it is an intellectually taxing time because a lot will depend on how we handle uh, this challenge. Um, if we don't have time for Q&A or too little, I will try to put in a little bit. If that doesn't happen, then uh, we will, uh, uh, hopefully during the Congress, many of the issues that both you and Srimuliani have raised will keep coming back. Let's move on to the final speaker today. Uh, this is Dr. Marie Panjestu, Managing Director of the World Bank. World Bank is slightly overrepresented uh, uh, today, but not by intention. It so happens, people's association with that. She was earlier Minister of Trade uh, for, of Indonesia. She was Minister of Tourism, so a range of sectors and tourism today is at the heart because of the uh, drop in demand that has taken place in that sector. She's a very distinguished economist in her own right, has taught at Columbia University, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, Singapore, Crawford School at ANU. With that brief introduction, Marie, the floor is now yours. Uh, thanks, Koshik. Uh, glad to be uh, on this panel and really wish it was physical and in Bali, <laughs> as the original plan was. Uh, I'd like to just uh, compliment, I think, the previous two speakers by taking a sort of a more global perspective and a, a developing country perspective, because uh, I guess sitting where I am at the bank now, uh, this is uh, how uh, we, we are trying to see uh, how uh, the world is going to look like for developing countries. Uh, and I will, I will say also a few things about East Asia. So I, I think if we start with the global uh, economy itself, um, uh, without coordination, I think what Danny was saying earlier is exactly what we're observing. You know, the most recent uh, global economic prospects, which, uh, which I, you know well, Kaushik, uh, uh, shows that the, there is going to be a very sharp rebound in the world economy, and it's the strongest post-recession uh, pace in 80 years. Uh, but uh, and it's advanced economy driven with uh, countries like the U.S. with very substantial fiscal uh, support. But it is very uneven uh, for emerging markets, uh, depending on the region. You know, China and in East Asia doing much better. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, you have an uneven recovery with sharp rebound uh, and then uh, uh, with emerging markets really uh, not recovering very well. Uh, I think that the, our data at the moment shows that only 30% of emerging markets, uh, emerging market development economies will be back to their per capita income compared to before pandemic uh, in, in 2022, compared to 90% of advanced economies who would have regained uh, that, that level uh, by 2022. And our poverty, extreme poverty is gonna go up uh, by uh, 150 million by the end of 2021. So uh, uh, I think the pandemic has exacerbated inequality between countries. And as Danny pointed out, it's going to affect the convergence trend that had been happening. Uh, and it's also obviously increasing inequality within countries because the pandemic hits hit the poor uh, and vulnerable uh, groups more, especially women and children and unskilled workers, and because they have unequal access to social services and digital uh, technologies. And what the, one of the analysis of the, the uneven recovery and the different speeds of recovery actually is very much related to, you know, the, the size of the stimulus and the size of the stimulus and the fiscal space has a lot uh, of relationship with a debt and debt servicing. So I think one big issue uh, I would hope IEA would also talk about is the whole uh, potential uh, debt uh, uh, overhang and debt, debt uh, potential debt crisis that could come uh, uh, with debt, debt stress uh, coming up. So the issue of debt relief and debt restructuring, uh, I think, I hope that IEA will, will be look, uh, looking at this. And the other one is obviously the uneven uh, access to vaccines. The, the inequitable access to vaccines is a big issue uh, in, in this uneven recovery. 
and uh, and a major hurdle to to the the, re the global recovery, uh, I would say. You know, in, I think only four percent of vaccines is reaching Africa uh, at the moment, compared to you know obviously developed countries which have uh, already uh, had a lot of access to act to vaccines. So I think equitable access of vaccines at speed and at scale uh, is a very much a global policy issue. And there are there's a supply issue which is very very linked to the trade uh, issues, the restricted the restrictions that are happening. How do you increase production, uh, in, including in developing countries? Uh, another uh, data that point that we have is that 88 percent of is a, a concentration of 88 percent of vaccine production and vaccine uh, inputs in very few uh, locations, mainly and it's mainly Europe and. And, and the US and to some extent China and the rest of the world and India and the rest of the world is Africa and uh, others are very dependent on, on these imported um, uh, supplies. Uh, and you know, of course, be, uh, before the vaccine issue, there was the food restrictions and the medical supplies issues. So I think the issue of trade restrictions uh, and how to in, in, the tr in, in kind of the trade policy that must happen moving forward uh, for for uh, you to address inequality is, is very important. Uh, last year uh, at the G20 meeting, there was an agreement that there should be a restraint on, on, on using these trade restrictions because they have such a big impact on food prices or availability of food or vaccines or medicine. And that really hurts the poorest countries the most. The, the decision, I mean, it was a sort of set of principles that when you undertake trade restrictions, it should be measured, transparent, uh, sunset clause, uh, and targeted. Yeah. So this is the principles, but whether they're implemented is, is something that we are looking at closely. And uh, to Danny's point, you know, trade restrictions are still there and actually increase uh, in the recent period, and subsidies are becoming popular. So, uh, you know, this kind of idea of uh, efficiency and resilience, and, you know, bringing back your strategic industries back to your country, including something like vaccine production uh, is something that that is uh, so that will need a global uh, cooperation and in vaccines uh, 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 we are uh, looking at this very carefully how to make sure that you have the supply and the demand matching and the financing and all these three have to be there together uh, otherwise you will not solve uh, the vaccine vaccination issue uh, i think east asia is doing much better than other countries uh, other regions uh, Middle East, uh, North Africa, Latin America, and Caribbean are really still expected not to be uh, recovering uh, as fast as East Asia. And of course, East Asia is somewhat driven by, by China uh, and Vietnam, who, who actually, I don't know about Vietnam now, but most recently there's been a wave, uh, but they have actually, they are actually going to be at a higher level uh, than pre-pandemic. Indonesia, I, Indonesia, Philippines, I think is doing well, but the other uh, countries may, may not be uh, doing as well. So uh, I think the recovery is very much uh, going to be affected by the ability to have a uh, fast and rapid scale of vaccines roll out. And this can be an issue uh, because of the, the constraints in supply. So that I think you're looking at you know, something like next year, mid or end of next year, before you can see uh, a large pr proportion of the world's population be vaccinated, not to mention possibility of variants and so on. So I think you, we have come to the realization that this is about living with the, the, the virus and managing uh, with the virus and how do you uh, actually uh, have a, a economic opening up uh, as you do that. Uh, let me, I know time is short. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, maybe two brief things uh, in the interest of time. Unfortunately, I wanted to say more, but. Just let me share two things. One is um, uh, how do you build back better? You know, uh, Sri Mulyani mentioned that uh, you use the crisis to, as an opportunity to build back better. What does that mean? You know, everybody's talking about building back better. In the U.S., it means one thing. It was actually Biden's uh, campaign. You know, building back better. Uh, but in a developing country context, what does it mean? So. Uh, I just wanted to share that at the bank right now, we are thinking very hard about this. Should there be a paradigm shift or not? In the sense that you have two crises. There's another global issue besides the pandemic. This is the climate change crisis. So how do, how do, you, how do we uh, build back better and respond 
uh, to the development challenges that have been accentuated by COVID plus the climate crisis. Because the climate uh, uh, change crisis actually affects the poorest uh, and most vulnerable countries the most uh, and the poorest and the most vulnerable in the country. Uh, our, our assessment also shows that uh, 130 million more people will, will become uh, extremely poor by 2030 if we don't uh, address uh, climate. Uh, and uh, the pandemic itself is telling you that, you know, because it is uh, going from animal to human, uh, it is something that is uh, showing you the, the relationship between people, planet, uh, and the economy. Uh, this zoonotic disease, and most, all, I think, all, epide all epidemics are actually uh, zoonotic in nature. And I actually, as a trade minister, went through the bird flu. And then we, at that time, we were all very busy uh, sort of looking at the One Health system. But after two years, uh, you know, everybody forgot about it. So we cannot forget about it anymore. So what, what we are uh, pro uh, proposing as sort of a paradigm shift right now, uh, the, way, uh, for the way forward for developing countries, it is a green, resilient, and inclusive path to development. It means, you know, we've always thought about green resiliency and inclusiveness, uh, but we've never thought about it as an integrated way and in a simultaneous and systematic way. And this is what we are, uh, really uh, pushing forward. Uh, and uh, what it really means is that, you know, you have, when you undertake a policy, you have to really think whether you can achieve uh, all of this. I'll just give you a very brief uh, an example, a fiscal stimulus, which can have this triple win, is a fiscal stimulus that uh, provides uh, funding for, uh, which funds a land restoration or coastal restoration, which is, creates cash for work programs, so it creates jobs and income. At the same time, you're restoring the land and uh, uh, coastal uh, areas that had been uh, affected. And uh, in, in the medium term, you're gonna improve the livelihoods of fishermen and farmers because they will have better yield uh, coming out of uh, these natural assets. That's, that's an example of, of how uh, uh, green resilient inclusive development works. So finally, uh, if I may uh, take uh, my, my two pre previous speakers have been very disciplined. Um, let me just take uh, one or two minutes more just to close on trade. Um, uh, I think uh, the, the, the data also shows there's been an uneven recovery in trade uh, where uh, the East Asian uh, countries have done much better uh, to, uh, to recover in trade. Uh, and it is very much related to whether you're integrated in the global value chains uh, or not. So trade in goods have recovered and it's been very uneven, uh, and it's the, the, the global value chains has been a, 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 a important in that respect. Uh, and the other interesting data is the, the, the lack of recovery in trade in services overall, because tourism and travel uh, have just not recovered. And it, this is gonna be one of the ones that take much longer to recover. But interestingly, trade in services uh, that are modern services, business services, financial services, uh, tele telecommunications and digital-based services, they, they actually remain positive. Uh, and this is telling you that the, issue, the importance of the trade in services within the, the global value chains, as well as uh, on its own. And it has uh, been very important uh, because of the pandemic as well. You know, the way we, we are doing trade um, uh, that is now or transactions uh, where, where digital has become much more important. This is just telling you where uh, we should be going uh, forward, right, in terms of, uh, of policies. And um, I, think, uh, I think the issue of global value chains, is it going to be, you're gonna see more reshoring or you're gonna be uh, more resilience compared to efficiency. Uh, our assessment at the moment shows that it's, this is not uh, happening yet when we surveyed uh, multinational companies they're thinking about it, but uh, it, it doesn't look like it's going to be very easy to disrupt a very complicated uh, global value chain. But whether they, but they will diversify in terms of location. So uh, the the old tr uh, thinking, uh, traditional thinking that if you want to attract uh, 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 yourself as a location for investment and trade, then all the re trade reforms, investment re reforms still uh, apply. Uh, I think another important uh, uh, data point that our analysis or assessment that we have uh, done recently is to look at trade costs. So trade costs for developing countries is still uh, almost twice uh, that of uh, developed uh, countries. 
and it's not tariffs. Tariffs is only one fourteenth of that uh, trade cost. So it's not uh, uh, about liberalization. In fact, it's more about trade facilitation. It's the logistics, uh, the, uh, the the um, uh, you know the physical infrastructure uh, efficiency and all the customs and border. I'm looking at Ambani customs and border and uh, regulations that that make it uh, uh, costly, right? So uh, a, a very easy way to do a stimulus, which doesn't take any budget from the finance ministry, is to just streamline and make this uh, these processes much more efficient. Of course, building out better ports takes money and time, but if you can just address these uh, regulatory barriers and make it easier to export and import, that can actually have a huge impact uh, on trade uh, and recovery. And actually, uh, I don't know whether Mbani remembers, but during uh, right after the global financial crisis, this is exactly what we did. Uh, and uh, you know, we, and it was costless in the sense that costless uh, in terms of just managing and making exports and imports flow better. Um, and I guess the, 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 the final thing I would say is that uh, linking it back to the green, resilient and inclusive recovery, I think if you look at the future of trade and competitiveness in the future, uh, the green and digital are going to be very important aspects. And uh, whether or not you have carbon pricing, whether or not uh, your product is sustainable across the value chain, all the way from the inputs, even how you produce and all the way to how you package it, uh, that it's disposable and so on. That's going to determine the competitiveness of your product uh, and your or your service. And, and this is going to be uh, how developing countries must, uh, must look at this and how they can respond to it. So it's not, not, not just about lower a labor cost and efficiency uh, anymore. And uh, the reality is already there. If, if Europe uh, imposes cross-border cross uh, adjustment taxes, that's already telling you uh, that they, they will uh, take, take that into account. And just to close that uh, a company like Tesla, the way they choose where they're gonna locate to produce their electric vehicles depends whether or not they can find a source of renewable energy to use uh, to produce uh, their cars. And this is uh, uh, you know, becoming a worldwide trend. So uh, uh, let me just close on that uh, note uh, and hope that uh, we can all uh, work together with this kind of uh, new way of thinking where uh, really build what, make, making reality to the building back better, especially from a developing country perspective. Thank you. Sorry to take more time uh, than the previous panelists. Murray, not at all. Uh, this was uh, very interesting. You draw attention to important things. What I was thinking is we'll take maybe five minutes. So uh, uh, cut in a little bit uh, to the deficit. We started about 15 minutes late, but we'll take five more minutes. I want to throw in uh, two questions. There are three uh, questions which have come from Rizman Rizman, Bhadraja, Mole Gamgoda, and Daisy Payne, which are related questions. I'll create one out of that, but I want to begin by throwing in a question or a concern of mine, in case uh, any of you have um, something to say to that. What does worry me, which is what all of you are talking about, is the unevenness of as we are coming out of it, the inequity as we are coming out, the poorer countries being hit worse. Within countries, the poorer segments being hit worse. My fear is this is going to get exacerbated, not just a short run thing in the long run for two reasons. One is, the rise of digital technology and uh, modern technology has been doing it over the last 40 years. Demand for labor is falling, moving towards capital. What worries me is that COVID is turning out to be a period of learning by doing in using digital technology and modern technology in a way where it's probably going to speed, pace it up much more. So it may exacerbate the problem of demand for labor gradually shrinking and the share of wage shrinking. Would there be some thoughts on, uh, do you expect this? Are there ways of countering it? Keep that as one question. And I'm blending the other three questions. All of these questions which have come are to do with um, uh, emerging economies and how should they handle. If industrial policy is back, should we, the developing countries begin to um, uh, think in terms of adjusting to it and, and working on that? Then also social spending, if we have to do more because the poor are being hit, 
will that heat up the economy or as Murray was towards the end touching on topics that even if there's greater expenditure, there, there is scope for saving in certain domains like the, you were referring, I, I could see to the global economic prospects and, and the costliness and waste over there. Are there ways of doing it? So I've blended the questions a bit, each of you one or two minutes each, and then we will have to stop. Anyone who wants to go, not each of you, but whoever feels like responding. Aishik, if I, if I may come Daddy, in do just... Yeah. Because this is this is something that's very close to my heart, and and we don't have a lot of time to talk about it. But I think you're you're absolutely right. I mean, my my take on 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 this is that that COVID uh, aggravates um, the uh, labor market and employment consequences of a lot of things that were already happening. That um, the new technologies, automation, uh, digital technologies, are fundamentally undermining the comparative advantage of developing countries in, in sort of low skill labor and therefore um, reducing the gains from trade as well as uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, reducing employment opportunities. Um, so I, 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 it raises a significant amount of challenges. The only way I can see my way out of this is to say that, that we need to sort of rethink our economic policies from, uh, you know, from a really much more of an employment uh, oriented, um, you know, that we, we, in economics, we think about consumer utility as maximization of consumer utility as the ultimate um, uh, standard. But really the one thing that affects our well being the most uh, is really ha having secure good um, uh, jobs. Uh, so our expressive utility as workers, I think, is, is probably, an, and there's no bigger loss to our life satisfaction than losing a job. Um, and so when you look at economics from that perspective, you just basically, you, you, you start seeing a lot of things very differently. Because if you start taking a jobs in a good jobs perspective, a lot of different policy domains start to look very different. You start to think about trade policy very differently in terms of what the employment multipliers are going to be? Are you really going to get employment from integrating into the global value chains or you know, digital trade or financial services might not get the right kind of employment? You start looking at in, in industrial policy very differently because it no longer becomes a question about innovation and productivity, um, but it becomes a question of, 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 of you know, generating good jobs. You look at macroeconomic policy very differently because then you say there's no better good job policy than having running a very tight demand economy where actually demand is out, you know, always a little bit outstripping uh, incipient supply. And that means, you know, doing away with some of our orthodoxies about excessive concerns of inflation. And I know this is all heresy uh, from, you know, a lot of our, our received standpoint, but I think we'll need to go more and more, I think, in that direction. Thank you very much, Dani. Uh, anyone else? You have to unmute Shimuliani, you unmuted, yeah. I must you. Well, um, Kosek, I appreciate thinking or rethinking uh, where the direction of the policy. As a policy maker, of course, then you have to uh, do something, uh, knowing or at least uh, understanding the trend uh, in the future. For example, you mentioned about the digital technology. So the question in this case, how we are going to make sure that the digital divide is not going to even uh, creating uh, the inequality even more. So for us, then uh, you are uh, challenged to provide the infrastructure, especially for country as big as Indonesia, to many parts of the Indonesia, which is not yet connected. So the question about the infrastructure, connectivity, so that people, especially now with the trend that you can have a flexible work, you can have a more digital connection, you are going to be able to then see the opportunity of creating job. As uh, Danny mentioned, that this may be a threat for the low skill labor, but at the same time, with the access of technology, you will not underestimate there are so many opportunities created for this digital technology to many part of the country, or segment of the society, which they can create a totally new job in this case. I mean, if you ask many of many students now, uh, Danny, if they ask what you want to be, and many of them will say that I want to be a YouTuber, 
I mean, that was not a labor uh, skill that we think, but this is, if you talk about millennial, many of them is saying that they want to be a YouTuber. Something which is not uh, perceived uh, as a job in the past, but it is now become a job because they can earn money. As well as this connectivity creating a lot of small medium enterprises can connect to the market easily. Uh, uh, and that's why uh, uh, the most important from the policymaker, how you are going to be able to create an infrastructure in which connectivity and infrastructure will uh, provide opportunity in which then a new job can be created. The second one uh, is about the industrial policy. This is very interesting. When you talk about uh, 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 the climate change and also within uh, uh, digital and uh, industrial policy, the climate change going into the direction of the car with low emission. And that means you are going to the electric car. Within the electric car, the technology of the, the battery is going to be very important. So many countries like Indonesia and also that responding to that will provide what you call it industrial policy of what you uh, call it the value added within our domestic economy. We call it hilirisasi downstreaming actually. So how you are going to make sure that your industrial policy will provide an opportunity for this commodity or merchandise which is going to be highly demanded to be value add in Indonesia. This is the global supply chains that Mari Pangesto mentioned earlier. But that is exactly that when you talk about supply chains and historically, you see that many countries, if they are linked to the supply chains, they have the ability to uh, reduce the poverty faster because they are linked to the global supply chains. They also can uh, capture the benefit of open trade because they've already also prepared and become part of this global trade which uh, uh, then uh, creating a prosperity uh, much faster. But of course, not all countries have the ability to create the supply chains or becoming the part of the supply chains. So maybe the question which is more relevant in this case, Tosik and Prof. Uh, Roderick, is actually how a country can prepare themselves to become part of the supply chains. You mentioned, especially when you link to this labor policy, creating labor as an important one. Previous, the two decades or three decades before, when you talk about part of supply chains, for many developing countries with low labor uh, level skill, uh, labor, then you are providing with uh, low wage as your comparative advantage. When you are then putting within the context that labor first, in which then the prosperity or at least uh, the ability of the labor to enjoy the surplus or the part of this productivity uh, change, then uh, wage should not become the part of comparative advantage. The question when you put it within the global context, there are so many countries still have to rely on the wage as their comparative advantage. So this is going to be a very challenging task. So transforming this labor into a more scale or fit to the future scale is going to be very critical. That's why education is very critical then. Like for example, Indonesia, during this COVID, we introduced what you call it employment card, which is actually people get more like quasi uh, safety net that is social uh, support. We provide cash, but in order for you to get the cash, you have to go into the training, digital training. So we reach out uh, up to 5.6 million people. They are now trained and there is like a shop, uh, shopping list of what kind of training digitally that they can participate. And then after they finish, then they are going to get. There is quite a lot of uh, a, a survey showing that this kind of training as well as the uh, cash transfer providing at least more as, as the society which is less stressful. They have something to do. And then they also feel more confidence. And it's an interesting survey that we try to get from this kind of new instrument or a, a diverse uh, instrument. What I'm saying is this, uh, in principle, when you talk about, uh, we need to put people first in this case. The people, uh, uh, whether this is on their skill, their ability to be part of the product, 
uh, production process so that they have become the productivity factors in the whole, what you call it, economic interaction. Then investing in a human capital is very, very important. The question is more on what kind of human uh, capital investment which can create or can achieve a better result of a fit for purpose in this case. And that is really the challenge that we really now uh, look whether this is on educational, vocational training, and also the digital uh, infrastructure to connect with them. The last one is of course, uh, 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 you mentioned about the social safety net and the uh, mod modus of delivery in this case, COSI. I think with the digital technology, we are uh, able to uh, accelerate the reaching out to the poor by name, by address, so there is an individual identity. Uh, not always easy, but that's definitely, there is a, a solution in that. And that can create a more, what we call it, a policy, which is more targeted and accountable. Meaning that if you have this much resources to be allocated for, your, for the people, and in a democratic system, uh, then you are going to say that this is the amount of money that we are going to allocate for the people. How much we are going to allocate for the poor and in what form? Is it a subsidy through the merchandise, like fuel subsidy, electricity subsidy, or this is going to be targeted direct subsidy to the poor? And with the digital technology now, it is going to be less costly to be able to target it's more accurate and less uh, 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 less costly. I think this is also creating an opportunity for any policymaker to improve their policy. So um, yes, it is uh, requiring a lot of new thinking on economic policy and uh, econ economic policy and direction. But I think we uh, have quite a lot of hope with the technology as well as the ability to respond. Last thing, also as a finance minister, uh, Kosik. Fiscal policy, which is usually decided uh, very long through the political process, right? You have to discuss with the Congress or the Parliament. They are going to approve and then they approve. And then when they started, the economy has already changed. The myth is going to change. That's why the flexibility of the fiscal policy is really, really needed. And that will require quite a lot of the political implication as well as the accountability. I myself, in this case, is uh, intensely uh, discuss with the parliament uh, in how we are going to design the fiscal policy, which need to be keep flexible because of the COVID providing always keep changing uh, a challenge for all of us. And that is uh, something that need to be not just exceptionally uh, practiced during this COVID, but should be the principle in the uh, medium and long term future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shumuliani. I won't even call on Marie because I know that she had something pressing immediately after this. Unless, Marie, you want to take one minute to respond. Otherwise, I was going to call it a close. There are more questions coming in, and the audience is growing through the session. But there is very little choice. We have to close. Is there anything you want to say, Mari, by way of closing? Or Yeah, I just want to close by saying that on the inequality issue. When I was a trade minister, I used to say, I'm not a trade minister. I'm a trade and development minister. So trade as a means to development. So while we see the gains from trade and how it's affected poverty, we really, really, really need to come up with good, uh, the, the, uh, the right uh, type of complementary policies to have the gains from trade be, be more widely distributed uh, and, and make it real. Otherwise, you are going to have the pushback uh, uh, on, on globalization and increased openness to trade. Maybe I'll just close on that. I, I wanted to say more, but uh, I'll close on that. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, all of you, for having stayed on longer. And we've got into the next session a little bit, but it, this was so worthwhile. We will get back to many of these topics over the next five days. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.